I am good, thank you very much for asking. How are you, Gabsmacked? Yeah, I'm not too bad. Richard Denison. Hello. Are you from Great Satan? Hey, I thought you were over that stuff. Of course not. Ha <laughs> ha. All right, so, uh, how do we, tell me, uh, Captain Del Tron, lovely to see you, my son. I don't think he's your son. He's probably not as hairy as you. Maybe not, but it's okay. Do you have anything? Ah, Catherine, have you yet accepted my offer of 2,000 camels? Because, hello, marhaba to you, Mr. Captain Deltron. Ah, you know the language of God. This is fantastic. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that, my friend. Uh, well, I do, so don't worry. All right, so how do astronomers test the theory of stellar, uh, stellar evolution? I mean, we don't live long enough. Well, I can tell you this. Tell me. We have no hope of observing the changes as they go through directly in a human lifetime. Or even in all of human history. Yeah, well, obviously. Thank you. However, we have a galaxy full of many stars. Okay. At different stages of development. All right. By compiling statistics about the properties and types of stars. Yeah. We can use our knowledge of how gases behave and how stars fuse atoms to piece together these different stages into a coherent life story for one star. Yeah, but how do you know it's actually true? Well, if our theory of stellar evolution can reproduce the stellar populations we see in the galaxy, it is a pretty good theory. All right, that's not too bad. Thank you, Gabriel. So, where are we? Now, what we were saying, let us come back and talk to you guys. When the hydrogen is depleted in the core of a star, why is the depletion of hydrogen in the core of a star such an important event? It is an important event because the hydrogen can no longer fuse into helium, and which means that the nuclear forces are gone, which means gravity can now take over. Ah, gravity. The time of death of the star. Yeah, something like that. So uh, we've got the outward pressure, which pushes out and which balances gravity. Now, we already spoke about this before, right? So gravity squeezes it. If there was no fusion, it would keep squeezing it and squeezing it and squeezing it from the mass. But of course, the squeezing of it actually causes the nuclear fusion to ignite, right? And begin. But once that fuel runs out, well, it's going to go nowhere, right? So gravity is going to take over. It's sort of like, uh, you know, you got fuel in a car pushing up the hill. Gravity wants to pull the car back down. When you run out of fuel, this happens. Oh, oh, uh oh, I'm out of fuel. Oh. So there you go. Then he falls back down the hill. No, not Bashar al-Assad. I am al-Assad. Do not confuse me with the dictator. Um, calm down, my friend. I'm sorry. I just do not like the dictator. Why not? Because I should be dictator. That's a fair point. All right. So with no energy source, then it obviously collapses, causing major change in the entire structure of the star. Of course, so the star is now, whoa, that was funny. Um, I don't know what he's doing. Bro, is everything okay back home? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you want me to ask? You asking me in Australia, everything's fine. Or are you asking Al-Assad? Al-Assad? No. It is not okay. Why? Because I cannot find a replacement for my wife. I thought you already had four wives. No, no, no. One died. You know this, Gabriel. Oh, yeah. I am looking for a fourth wife. I offered Catherine 2,000 camels, but she said no. I don't think she said no. I just think she said wait till after exams. Ah, after the exams, then I give her 1,000 camels. That makes no sense. Why would you offer her less camels afterwards? Because she does not answer me straight away. So there has to be some negotiation. She wants freedom. She gets less camels. Okay, freedom gives you less camels. What are you going to do? All right, when a star runs out of hydrogen, energy generation by fusion stops and the core collapses. I think he does need to get married. Uh, uh, if you support that type of shit, then go for it. Why not? 
get married and have some kids or have kids and get married or have kids and don't get married. Suicidal Raj. All right, so as a result, the course temperature increases and additional energy is radiated away with a higher temperature. Married, geez, being stuck with one woman. Are you talking from experience? Uh, I've been wondering actually what it's like to be married. Doesn't look like it's an interesting proposition to me. Who knows? Um, all right, with a higher temperature, the fusion in the hydrogen shell around the core becomes more efficient. All right, so the core puts out even more energy than it did as a main sequence star. What is astronomy? I never went to school. <laughs> Don't do it. All right, I'm taking David's advice. I'm not doing it. <laughs> Dave's advice. Um, I should do a scope with married men. Oh, my God. We should, we, I should get interviewed married men. And ones that are happy, ones that are unhappy, ones that were married, ones that have been married multiple times, and just get all of their views. Because no one talks about that. It's always from one perspective. K. Hey, suicidal Raj. Hmm. All right. So if you haven't gone to school, then stay here, my friend, and you will learn maybe even less. <laughs> you might forget stuff you already knew. All right. So this is quite interesting. Because the star can now compress even further as it's about to die, it actually burns even harder. And that's the same as a car. When a car has less fuel, right, it can go even faster because it weighs less. So it's something like that, I guess. As the gas in the outer layer expands, it becomes less dense. It cools down and the star's color changes to red. You're speaking too fast. Uh, I am sorry, suicidal Raj. I apologize. If you go to my YouTube channel at Gab Smacked, G-A-B-S-M-A-C-K-E-D, and play my videos in half speed, then it will be easier for you, I hope. Because I do that with French. I actually do that with French and Italian. And if it's Arabic poetry, I also do this. Okay. The star. <laughs> what? Say what? The star has a carbon core in which a small amount fuses with helium to form oxygen. What happens here? Yeah. Uh, okay. So around the core, helium continues to fuse into carbon. So the inside is like, I'm turning into carbon. <laughs> So from the inside out, it's getting solid and solid and solid. The sun, right? Um, the helium the, and the outside. This reason the hydrogen fuses into helium. So now the outside is fusing and fusing and fusing. That's just crazy. It's like I'm turning into stone. That's sort of what it's like. It's like I'm turning into stone. That's sort of what happens. The temperature of the core is about 300 million Kelvin, which, by the way, is too cool to fuse carbon on a large scale. 300 million Kelvin is too cool to fuse carbon. The heat of the interior is enough to expand the star to incredible size hundreds of times its previous radius. And that is why, my friends, the sun in the future will swallow the earth and kill all of us. So, uh, what is a planetary nebula? I said, well, my friend, a planetary nebula is the ejected outer layer of a giant star. Really? An ejected outer layer? Yes, an ejected outer layer. Not ejaculated, ejected. How is he doing that? How am I doing what? You tell me, what am I doing? I don't know, I don't know what he's talking about, sorry. Oh, okay. I will not offer you any camels. Anyway, so, uh, what have we got here? Um, the planetary nebula is the ejection. So basically you're shoving off the shells. Okay. So it is in the shape of a spherical shell and is composed of relatively cool, thin gas. This shell often appears as a ring, believe it or not. The thickest parts are seen in cross section and look like a ring. And the parts towards the core are thin and emit little light. The farther away from the center, we look the thicker, the layer of gas we are looking through. All right. That's just our perspective. So, uh, as a dying star sheds its outer layers, so you, it's ripping off its clothes, okay, the dead core of the star, which is now like almost like stone, you, the equivalent of like stone, just dead, it's doing nothing, right, 
is exposed. Ooh, we've exposed it. All right, in the case of a solar mass star, so a star just like our sun, the core will be made of carbon. The core stabilizes at a radius roughly equal to that of the Earth, so they don't come out burned. Uh, sorry, can you write a little slower? Because I can't understand. <laughs> Suicidal Raj. Mr. Can't Speak English has a play on words in his name. Sneaky, sneaky. <laughs> All right. In the case of a... You know what I love about trolls? I love, tro I love you guys because it shows a degree of wit and it helps me expand and increase and sharpen my wit. It's a good feeling. All right. So the core stabilizes at a radius roughly like the Earth. Jenna Texan. Sean, what you doing here, fool? It's a text, Sean. All right. So this means that it has a incredibly high density. Oh, my God. All right. So, so basically, our sun, after it blows off, hey, hey, blows off, after it blows off its outer shells, it's going to be left of a carbon ball the size of the Earth, and it would be a million times as dense as the sun. Right? So that is insane. You would not want to be standing on that. You would be crushed into a pulp. As it still represents about 10% of the star's original mass t packed into a small piece. I thought I was on YouTube. <laughs> My friend, I think you have virtual waffles. <laughs> um, if you know what I mean. The small surface area also translates into low luminosity. You'd never run out of printer toner. This is true. <laughs> you would never run out of printer toner. <laughs> um, all right. Despite its white hot temperature, since it is not actively generating energy, it will gradually cool down and fade from red to white to black. And it will just become a black ball of carbon. Crazy. So it's just like an ember. Like, like you know, you when, you when you turn off the fire, you've still got the embers just glowing. All right. The age of a star cluster. How do you measure the age of a star cluster? I'm going to need Al-Assad's help for this one. Okay, first of all, Jen the Texan, I would like to offer you 3,000 camels. I know this is a bit more than Catherine, because I believe you will marry me straight away. Um, I don't know, she is from Texas, so, you know, she's going to kick your ass. Oh, no problem, she can kick my ass in the bedroom anytime. I, I said, I thought you had three wives already. Yes, but they do not kick very hard. All right, so we got here... Uh, as a cluster evolves, its more massive main sequence stars become red giants and die out, leaving only fainter low mass sequence stars. Yes, this is correct. So we check on the cluster by the age of its oldest star. Okay, so that's sort of like checking the age of a family by looking at the age of the oldest person in the house. Does that sort of make sense? Possibly. Okay. So it's more massive mass to become registered at low mass main sequence stars. We note the temperature and luminosity of stars that are about to leave the main sequence and translate that into a mass. Gotcha. So because they're just about to leave the main sequence. So because of that, you can actually tell from their shifting light what mass they are. The mass and luminosity help us calculate the main sequence lifetime of that star. So then you know which type of star it is. So if it's like a sun type of star, you want whatever he's smoking. Uh, <laughs> he smokes camels. <laughs> All right. Uh, the mass and luminosity help us calculate the main sequence lifetime of that star. Okay. Gotcha. Main sequence lifetime of that star, which is a good estimate of the age of the cluster. All right. Interesting stuff. So, what are the Roche lobes? The Roche lobes of a binary system. Okay. In a binary star system, so when you have two stars, the region around each star in which its gravity dominates is known as its Roche lobe. Gotcha. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. When you have two stars, right, what's happening is that when you're close to one star, gravity will pull you to that star. When you're close to the other one, gravity will pull you to the other one. But guess what that means? That means there must be a point in the middle that's a balance, that's an equilibrium. So if you go past one side, you enter the Roche lobe of one. If you go to the other, you go into the rush lobe of the other star. So that's what's going on. Okay. So, we're going to get into some maths pretty soon. Okay. What we're going to do 
is we are going to use the radius luminosity temperature relation to calculate the radius of a red supergiant with temperature 3000 Kelvin and total luminosity of 10,000 times the, that of the Sun. How many planets of our solar system would this star engulf? Okay, let's do it. I always miss your questions. I'm so sorry. What question did I miss of yours? I want whatever he's smoking. Yo, yo. Damn it, I've missed it. Hmm, I've missed your question. I'm sorry. You know, if I ever miss your question, but if you're a Patreon member, it's easy. Just shoot me a question in Patreon because most of my stuff is based on my Patreon members anyway. Um, but if you are not a Patreon member, shoot me a message at Twitter at Gabversity or direct message me at facebook.com forward slash Gab Smacked, S-M-A-E-C-K-E-D. Shoot me a direct message there and then I can, because I always check those in case I miss it. Alrighty, so let us look at this formula. Are you guys ready? Okay, let's do it. Great, now I drop my pens and I drop my freaking bloody shit house. Uh, I can't exit out of this Facebook live stream, please help. <laughs> uh, all right, so let us look at the formula. Are you guys ready? Let's do it. Here is the formula. Now, what have I done with the freaking magnifying glass? I am the klutz of all klutzes. Jeez. I give up. I can't see your questions. I'm not getting any. Are you messing with me, Jen? Your questions aren't showing up. <laughs> all right. So we have R, right? Over R of the sun, and that's the red supergiant, okay, squared equals the luminosity of the red supergiant over the luminosity of the sun, okay multiplied right, by the temperature of the sun over the temperature of the red super giant okay to the power of four all right so that is our equation now what did they tell us they told us that the uh, the radius um, where am I here Man, I don't care about the sun. I want to cook some waffles without burning them. <laughs> well, you are definitely in the wrong scope, my friend. All right, so what did they tell us? They said that the luminosity was 10,000 that of the sun. So that means that that's going to be 10,000 of the sun, because it's 10,000 by the sun. And the temperature of the sun is... 5780 Kelvin, and they said that the red supergiant one is 3000, and we put that to the power of 4, and that is going to equal 130, 138,000 over 1. So that 138,000, right, we want that there. Is going to equal the red, the radius of the supergiant over the radius of the sun, all squared. Okay, that. So we just solved it. We chucked in the numbers into this equation. Okay, so just just going one more time, we put in the luminosity of the red supergiant over the luminosity of the sun, which is ten thousand to one. We put in the temperature of the sun surface temperature versus the surface temperature of the red supergiant, which is fifty-seven eighty five thousand seven hundred eighty. Kelvin, your head's hurting, you need some waffles, man, over 3,000 Kelvin, all to the power of 4. Then, that equals this, right, and that equals that squared. So, clearly, 
we have to square root it. Hey, 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 square root. So that implies that the radius of the red supergiant compared to the radius of the sun is going to equal 370 times the sun. So that's it. So in other words, that star, based upon just knowing the luminosity and knowing the temperature, we can figure out that relative to our sun, the radius is 370 times bigger. All right, what does that mean? Well, 370 times the sun's radius. Again, you missed me. You are so messing with me. I can't see your questions anywhere. I'm, I can, I'm rewinding. I give up. That's all I have. I give up. And then you, you missed me. So you are messing with me. Unless Periscope is blocking every single one of your questions because it's jealous of you being here talking to us. I don't know. Um, all right. So... Uh, what do we got here? Um, I completely forgot what I was saying. All right, so 370. That means that it would be 1.7 astronomical units. Um, 370 times that of the sun, which is 1.7 astronomical units. All right, that's pretty bad. So basically, once our sun turns to a red supergiant, it's bye-bye Earth because the sun will keep getting closer and closer and... Phew, wash right over the earth and melt it into nothing. There you go. So, let's do a gab, I would never troll you. Mwah, that's a shame. Sometimes I like getting trolled. <laughs> but your questions are definitely not showing up. So, unless they're showing up on, on other people, can other people being able to see them. Okay, so now, what would be, now we're going to use the formula again, but we're going to use it in another way to find something else out. What would be the luminosity? Why can't we just land on the sun when it's dark out? It's a good question. <laughs> mm. Because then you would burn more than your waffles, my friend. All right, so uh, we can use the formula, right, again. And now we're just going to rearrange the formula. I'll show you. So now... Let us rearrange the formula. Rearranging, rearranging the formula gives us this. Luminosity that we want over the luminosity of the sun. Okay. Equals. Come on, you bastard. There we go. There we go. All right. Equals T. Temperature of the, you know, the, the new, the new version. So once, let's just say the new, we'll call it new because that'll be when the sun expands. Over the temperature of the surface of the sun at the moment, to the power of four. All right, so it's the same formula, but we're rearranging it. Before we had, we had this on this side. Now we're going to move it there and put that one there, right? So that, and then uh, we have R, the radius new over the radius of the sun and that is squared okay so now they said if the if the radius was one astronomical unit okay and the surface temperature was 3000 k's 3000 kelvin so that means that th this one t my darling these equations are simple tonons they are they are very, very simple. This is introduction astronomy. <laughs> T nu. This is like high school maths. That's all that's needed for this one. Um, T nu in this case is 3000 Kelvin. And we know temperature, surface temperature of the sun. That's 5780 Kelvin. And they said the radius was one astronomical unit. So the radius of the new one equals one astronomical unit, which happens to equal very, very simple. <laughs> it's not just very simple. It's a very simple. All right. And that is 150 million kilometers. It's, it's around 93 million miles, I'd say. 
something like that. Right? So, which is around around ninety three million miles. All right. So that's the new radius, and the radius at the moment of the sun. equals 686,000. That's a one big damn difference, 686,000 kilometers, which I would dare say is probably around, how many miles would you say that is? For, for about 400,000 miles, something? What is life? Life is being aware that you're going to die. That's what I would suggest life is. Now, all we have to do is plug these into this equation. So, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So, we're going to know this. Okay. And we know, hey, hey, snoop and noops. Okay. So, if we work that out, that means that it's going to be 3370. Darling, teach those fitting to your genius. <laughs> My dear, there is no one fitting. No, that's, that's uh, terrible. Uh, you are way too sweet. Hello, Snoop and Noops. Welcome. Um, I like to mix it up, get different audiences. So there you go. That is some basic astronomy. And the last one we did was identical particles. If you had a look at that for quantum mechanics, that was a lot of fun. So that ends that one. We're done. And let's see if I can find the other one. So we can get it over with. Oh my god. Okay. I think that's it. That's all we're doing. The next here is the life cycle of stars. And I got my magnifying glass. Good thing I stocked up on water to live longer. <laughs> I have to say, some of your stuff is pretty good. So welcome aboard, my friend. Um, and we'll have to apologize to Jen. Where is our friend Jen? Jen the Texan. Because her mind is one of those few. And it can be a pain up the butthole <laughs> to be one of those few. Okay. So. The life cycle of stars. Stars are not eternal. And as we know, they're not eternal. All right. So parameters... Dense dark clouds possibly forming stars in the future. That's pretty cool because as these these clouds get denser and denser and denser and denser and, denser and then they get and then poosh, ignite poosh, and then they just, their solar power just blows all the dust everywhere away. Hey hey. So first it sucks and then it blows. All right. So the next one: parameters of giant molecular clouds, constructions of giant molecular cloud cores. Here's one. This is gorgeous. I love the photo of this one. Thanks to my mother's printer. You're my Da Vinci. And Jen, you are my Texan. All right. Factors resisting the collapse of a gas cloud. Thermal energy, magnetic fields, rotation, and turbulence. External trigger required. Hey, hey, you need an external trigger to initiate the collapse of clouds to form stars. I'm sure there's plenty of triggers around today. All right, so sources of shock waves triggering star formation. That's pretty awesome. You get a shock wave from some explosion, and it sends this pulse through this cloud, and it just wakes it up. Like, it's, that's just crazy. I love that stuff. Um, previous star formation can trigger further star formation. Through number one, ionization fronts of hot and massive OLB stars, which produce a lot of UV radiation. Massive stars die young. So there you go, guys. Massive means you die young. So try not to get too massive. O and B stars only exist near sites of recent star formation, which is very interesting. Very interesting. That's, that's quite amazing. So you need the really big ones to die to give birth to regular stars. So we're probably, there go my biceps. <laughs> uh, you have one of the best timing from middle school. You are really smart. Uh, yeah. I barely graduated from middle school, actually, believe it or not. Um, stars are formed during the collapse of cores of giant molecular clouds. The radius is 50 parsecs. So just to give you an idea, a giant molecular cloud, right, you're talking about 170 light years across. Right? In other words, if you sent a message from one side in, as a radio wave, 
the other side would not get it for 170 years. <laughs> That's actually not true because space is expanding, but it's pretty damn big. Uh, dense cores. Um, the mass is 100,000 masses of the sun. And the temperature is almost absolute zero, right? Dense cores. The radius, 0.1 of a parsec, mass is one of the sun. Much too cold and too low density to ignite. Clouds need to contract and heat up in order to form stars. All right, so shock waves. Here are the triggers. You ready? So one of the triggers is... <laughs> I was going to make some stupid Trump joke. Um, previous star formation can trigger further star formation through shocks from supernova explosions. Supernova. So you have a super, supernova explosion, which ex basically is brighter than all of the stars in the galaxy while it's exploding, right? So, and then that mad ass explosion, that would actually kill life on Earth. If there was a supernova that exploded and we were on the receiving end of that, even if it was light years away, it would kill everyone from the radiation. Want to buy some of this weed? Ah, that explains why you're here. All right. Well, then, my friend, um, that must be good stuff. <laughs> All right. Sources of shock waves triggering star formation. Giant molecular clouds are very large and they collide with each other. Ah, giant molecular clouds could collide with each other, causing mad ass friction. <laughs> okay. Stellar formation. That's pretty much it. I think that ends our lecture. Let me just double check. There's nothing else. Do we have anything else? Nope, that's done, that's done, that's done, done, beautiful, all done, that's awesome. Oh no, we've got more stuff, we've got the Milky Way stuff happening, damn you. Oh, we can do that in the next lecture, that's fine, because I need to go back and do some quantum mechanics, my friends. What the hell? So my printer printed off like three copies of the same lecture. I don't know why. Protostellar sources of shock waves triggering. The hell? Hydrostatic equilibrium, energy transport. Ah man, I still got all my lectures are messed up, man. Damn you! The cycle life of stars. Sources of shock waves and formation. I found it. All right. Sources of shock waves triggering star formation. I think we'll do this next time because I'm bored. I want to go do some quantum mechanics. All right. Love you guys. I will see you shortly on our quantum mechanics lecture. Mwah. Facts don't care about your feelings.